Lachelle Hobson was born February 12, 1993, and lived with her mother in Columbus, Ohio. She is described as outgoing and smart and graduated in the top 25 of her class from Washington High School in Massillon, Ohio. She is also a graduate of Cleveland State University and worked in an administrative position for an insurance company. On Christmas Day in 2019, 26-year-old Paris was at a family gathering at her grandparents' home in Massillon, where she grew up. During the gathering on Shriver Avenue Southeast, she appeared anxious and was constantly pacing back and forth. About 2.30 p.m., she left to go for a walk to Shriver Park to clear her head, which was only a few blocks away. Her mother was texting her after she left, telling her to pray and assuring her everything would be okay. When she didn't receive any text back, her mother went outside and checked Paris's car and found that she had left behind her cell phone charging, wallet, driver's license, and debit card. Her mother then drove to the local park, but Paris was not there and nowhere to be found. The next day, her mother attempted to report her missing, but was told she had to wait because Paris was an adult. Sadly, she has never been heard from again. There were no messages on her phone that indicated she was going to run away or meet up with anyone. In fact, she sent her final outgoing text message to her church pastor to ask if there were any services that evening. During the initial search, a neighbor said that Paris had stopped by and wished them a Merry Christmas before heading on to the park. According to her family, she wasn't involved with drugs and didn't suffer from any mental illnesses. However, her mother, Rochelle, stated that Paris had not been acting like her normal outgoing self recently and seemed distant and was having trouble sleeping. Her cousin stated that Paris was dating a man who was trying to alienate her from her family and friends, but it is unclear if this man played a role in her disappearance. Unfortunately, there is no other information available about this man she was dating. On June 16, 2017, two years before Paris went missing, her brother Perry Hobson was a passenger in his own vehicle, apparently going to work. The driver of his car passed other vehicles in a no-passing zone and caused a head-on collision. The driver then fled the scene, leaving Perry unconscious and critically injured. To this day, no one knows who was driving his car that fled the scene. Perry remained on life support for 10 months before passing away in 2018 at the age of 23, leaving behind two children. Perry was her only sibling and her family stated that his death deeply affected her. She desperately wanted to find out who was driving her brother's car and was constantly preoccupied with this. Her family speculates that it is possible she had found out who was responsible for her brother's death and met with foul play, but there is no evidence to back up that theory. Weeks after her brother's death, a local high school used his car as a prop in a prom drunk driving campaign. This upset his family because Perry was not a drunk driver and they had not given them permission to use the car. Sadly, there is little information available in this case, and as of today, Paris remains missing and the case unsolved. Bambi Lynn Madden was born June 21, 1974, to William and Phyllis Burns. She was described as fun-loving, happy, and was very close to her family. At the age of 34, Bambi was married to Tom Madden and had three children, Tom Jr., Scott, and Crystal, and a granddaughter. Bambi was petitioning the courts to get custody of her granddaughter and was scheduled for a hearing on January 12, 2006. Sadly, the night before she was scheduled to go to court, she would vanish. At the time, Bambi was living at 29 Winding Way in Binghamton, New York. At around 11 p.m., she left on foot to buy beer at a nearby convenience store. After leaving for the store alone, she has never been seen again. Surveillance cameras showed that she never made it to the store that night. She did not own a cell phone and had only about $5 in cash with her at the time she disappeared. Family says she was very happy with her life at the time she disappeared and would have never left her children behind. She was also looking forward to getting temporary custody of her granddaughter the next day. 
At the time of her disappearance, Bambi often visited Sarah's Pub and the Brass Rail Grill, both bars on Clinton Street in Binghamton. However, no one at the bars remembers seeing her after January 11th. Bambi had struggled with drugs and was arrested on misdemeanor drug charges before her disappearance, but was doing better. Her loved ones describe her as a friendly person and had no known enemies. According to reports, there is no evidence that leads to the belief that the upcoming court hearing regarding her grandchild had anything to do with her disappearance. It is reported that she was only trying to get temporary custody of her daughter's daughter to prevent her father from getting custody for unknown reasons. About two years later, someone strangely spray-painted graffiti on the outside of a church wall in Binghamton that read, Bambi Madden, 29 Winding Way, arrested, died in police custody, statement under oath, witness call FBI. But Binghamton police at the time said none of the claims in the graffiti were true and none of it opened new avenues for investigators to follow. Every year on the anniversary of Bambi's disappearance, her family holds a candlelight vigil they issue a plea for information that could lead to her safe return. Sadly, there is little information available in her case, and as of today, it remains unsolved. Julius Tadarius Jones was born May 5, 1985, and lived in Meridian, Mississippi. He was described as a jokester and liked to make people laugh. On August 14, 2011, at the age of 26, he had Sunday dinner with his family before going out for the night. His mother, Tabitha Jones, remembers cooking his favorite meal of fried chicken and macaroni and cheese. Sadly, she was unaware that this would be the last meal she would ever cook for her son. Julius never came home that night and would vanish into thin air. Two days later, his Buick Century was found by police near an abandoned home in the 1200 block of 27th Street in Meridian. A search of the vehicle in a nearby creek produced no clues as to his whereabouts. His family members are devastated by his disappearance and are continually searching for answers. They believe that there are people in the area who know what happened to him, and they are hoping those individuals will eventually come forward. His mother has since founded an organization called the Life and Love Missing Persons Support Group, which seeks to help others coping with missing family members. She also keeps his car in the backyard to see if anyone may have a memory of what has happened to her son. Officers with the Meridian Police Department say there have been no leads in the case since his car was found. Sadly, there is very little information available in his case, and as of today, it remains unsolved. Jason Sims Jr. was born April 24, 1999, and lived in Fairfield, Alabama with his parents Natasha Wright and Jason Sims Sr. in the 100 block of 59th Street. In October of 2013, the Department of Human Resources began investigating his parents for possible neglect and child abuse. DHS discovered the home to be in poor condition with evidence of neglect and contacted authorities who later issued arrest warrants for neglect of children. In October of 2014, authorities attempted to serve the arrest warrants to Natasha and Jason. When they arrived at the home, the family was missing and police believed the pair fled to avoid being served the warrants. Three months later, on January 23, 2015, Natasha was found unconscious on her front doorstep due to a medical condition and was hospitalized. When she regained consciousness, she began talking about a boy named Jason Jr. At the time, investigators were only aware of two children, ages 10 and 12 in the household, and neither were named Jason. When questioned, Natasha stated she last saw him in their home but couldn't say when. Natasha's statement, as well as a thorough investigation, soon provided evidence of two more children, ages 15 and 9, belonging to Natasha. These two children had never been enrolled in school, nor did they have any medical records, despite Jason Jr., the 15-year-old in question, having autism and was nonverbal. Police soon found Natasha and Jason Sr.'s three other children in the care of relatives in Mulga, Alabama. Due to the condition of the family's home, Fairfield police would bring in a hazmat crew to help search for Jason Jr., but he was not found. 
Family members stated they were unaware of a child named Jason Jr. and couldn't provide any leads. The three other children were then taken and placed in foster care. Later in 2015, Natasha filed a protection from abuse order against Jason Sr. He was originally charged with a felony for failure to report a child missing, but would take a misdemeanor plea bargain. Despite sharing his name, Jason Sr. stated the boy was not his biological son and was therefore not responsible for reporting him missing. His defense attorney has gone so far as to suggest that Jason never actually existed. He claims that his client is not the father and therefore is not responsible for reporting a missing child who he claims he barely knew or saw. Jason Sr. and Natasha have maintained their statements. They claim to not know where Jason is or what could have happened to him. No one knows where Jason is or how long he has actually been missing. The only proof that Jason Sims Jr. existed is a birth certificate and a few pictures that may be of him. Jason Sr. is not listed as the father on the birth certificate and authorities can find no medical records and no recent pictures of the child. The lead detective said Natasha is cooperating and doesn't know where he went, but assures authorities that he was very real. Local law enforcement stated his disappearance is one of the most bizarre situations they've encountered, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Khadijah Rose Britton was born April 22, 1994, and lived in California. In school, she would be a star athlete and a 4.0 student. She had dreams of going to college and playing basketball and was also a Wailaki member of the Round Valley Indian Tribes. At the age of 23, she had just gotten out of an abusive relationship with a man named Neji Tony Fallis IV. Along with abusing her, he also had a history of domestic violence charges against other women. On February 7, 2018, in the tiny town of Cavello, California, Khadijah was visiting a friend in the 23,000 block of Airport Road. At some point, Fallis and his new girlfriend, Antonia Bautista Dawson, pulled up in a vehicle. Armed with a small Derringer pistol, Fallis went to the door of the house and demanded that Khadijah come out and speak to him. A physical altercation ensued, and he chased Khadijah around the car, which was being driven by Dawson. He would eventually catch and hit her and shove her into the car. Dawson would then speed away with them all inside and with several people witnessing the incident. Sadly, she has never been seen again. A week or two before she went missing, she told some domestic violence counselors that Phallus had attacked and abducted her. She filed a complaint against him for it and due to his prior criminal history, he could have gone to prison if convicted. Only hours before her disappearance, she went to the police and dropped the charges. Her family believes Phallus most likely coerced her into doing this. The witnesses to her kidnapping did not come forward with their story until after Khadijah's family realized she was missing. Ten days after she was reported missing, Phallus was arrested for her disappearance and charged with assault, kidnapping, first-degree burglary, threats to commit a crime resulting in death or great bodily injury, attempted murder, and being a felon in possession of a firearm and ammunition. He pleaded not guilty and refused to cooperate with the investigation. However, authorities were later forced to drop most of the charges against him due to lack of evidence. Therefore, Phallus' bail was reduced from $400,000 to $35,000 and he was released not long afterwards, although he still faced the charges of possession of a gun and ammunition. In August 2018, Dawson was arrested for felony suspicion of harboring and concealing a wanted felon. She admitted to being an accomplice to Phallus and helping him hide several firearms during his arrest by Round Valley Tribal Police. Both of them had agreed to plead guilty, Fallis for felony firearms possession, and Dawson to being an accomplice. He was then sentenced to four years in prison under a plea agreement and taken into custody. Dawson, who was released on bail after her August arrest, pled guilty to the crime, but two months later, she failed to appear in court for her sentencing and became wanted by the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office. She was eventually caught and booked into the county jail on December 12, 2018. She was ordered to have no contact with Phallus and to spend six months in an inpatient drug rehabilitation program. 
Both the police and Khadijah's family believe she was murdered and Fallis remains the prime suspect in her case. Witnesses of the abduction later gave conflicting statements to police, making the case more difficult to solve. Cavello has been taken over by criminals and residents are truly frustrated. Fallis was even arrested again and charged with driving with a gun and possession of a crack pipe but once again released. Khadijah's family and police believe there is someone out there who knows something and is just afraid to come forward. A reward of $85,000 for information leading to Khadijah has been offered by an anonymous donor and another $25,000 has been raised by the family. Even the FBI is also offering a reward of $10,000. However, the total reward of $120,000 has still not led to an arrest and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Karen Cho was born July 4, 1983 in China, and she and her mother would move to Grenada, Mississippi in February of 1992 following her parents' separation. Karen's father would not come to America and would instead remain in China. In 1994, Karen was a student at Lizzie Horn Elementary School and was described as a kind girl by her friends and was reportedly a good student who enjoyed her academics. Her grades were good, even with her still trying to learn English. At the age of 10, she was living at the River Hills Apartments on Monroe Street with her mother, stepfather, and baby brother. On May 21, 1994, her stepfather, Sin Dong Hee, was home with Karen and the baby while her mother, Wen Mei Hua, was working at the Grand Palace Chinese Restaurant. When May returned home from work at midnight, Sin Dong said he noticed around 11 p.m. that Karen was missing. He said he let her go outside to play at 6.30, and when he checked on her at 11, she was gone. She and her husband then called the police to report her missing. Extensive searches of the area revealed no signs of Karen, and investigators believe she may have been abducted. During the afternoon of her disappearance, two children who knew Karen reportedly saw her getting into a van with a tall Asian man outside of a store in Grenada. This is the last confirmed sighting of Karen that afternoon, and suspicion has it that the tall Asian man could be her stepfather, Sendong. Five months later, in October of 1994, investigators considered kidnapping suspect Philip Dean Fleming as a possible suspect in Karen's disappearance. A month earlier, on September 12, 1994, Fleming kidnapped 8-year-old Santana Renee Boyd from Bramlett Elementary School in Oxford, Mississippi, and then released her at a McDonald's in Jackson, Tennessee. Fleming is also suspected of three attempted abductions in central Mississippi the day before Santana was kidnapped. He was found in Florida using an alias in October of 1994. His identity was confirmed through fingerprints after he was arrested for auto theft. Investigators simply wanted to speak with him about Karen's case. However, they had no evidence that he was in the area when Karen's abduction occurred, and it's unknown if he's still considered a suspect in her abduction. As of today, Sindong is considered the primary suspect in her disappearance. He refused to take a polygraph exam regarding the case, and Karen's teachers at her school told police that she would always show up to school with bruises. May and Sindong later moved to Memphis, and Sindong would be convicted of assaulting her at a motel in Nashville, Tennessee. During the incident, Sindong allegedly admitted to killing Karen. She reported this admission to the police, but Sindong denied it. He was subsequently deported back to China due to his aggravated assault conviction. Investigators stated his deportation had nothing to do with Karen's disappearance, but they believe Sindong probably murdered her on the day she went missing. Investigators have noted they have no actual proof of Sindong's involvement, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. <music> 